God's got something for you this week. Are you ready for it? That's the issue. You know, is your heart hungry or are you just going through the mere motions of tradition, religion, a culture of church attendance, or are you desperate for God? You're looking at a, at a God-desperate man. <laughs> I live perpetually pregnant with vision. If I don't have God's touch, God's breakthrough, I can't do. Of myself, I can do nothing. For me to accomplish God's will, I need God's touch upon my life. I need God's constant download and refreshing in my life to energize me, to empower me, to do the work that He's called me to do. But you think, well, that's great because you're a missionary, you're a carrier of God's word to the nations. It doesn't matter if you're the least of the brethren. You are just as called by God. You are just as chosen by God. You should be just as desperate for God. Hallelujah. The Bible says, Blessed are they that hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Or you could say, Blessed are they that hunger and thirst for a breakthrough. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst for revival. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst for a miracle. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst for a God download in their life. Whatever you are desperate for, God will meet you at that place. Too many people have just slipped into a form of godliness and deny the power thereof. They just go through the mere motions, the routine of being Christian, living good moral lives, not doing anything wrong, but not doing what God's called them to do. There's a difference between not doing what's wrong than doing the will of God. And God's called you. God's put His hand upon your life. Your pastor and I prayed in preparation for these meetings. And the theme that we came up with is follow Him. We are wanting this week to raise up followers of Him, Jesus. Hallelujah. There's a difference between someone who, who sees Jesus receives from Him than those that see Him, hear Him, receive from Him, and then follow Him. Many hear Him, see Him, get the benefits of Him, but they're not followers of Him. There's a difference between being the recipient of what God can do for you than following Him. This week, we want to raise up God followers. Now go with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 4. And we'll read from verses 18 to 22. And if you're going to be in these next few meetings, you might as well mark your Bible in this spot because we'll go there every single meeting. I'm pretty sure about that. Lord God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, God, you are the creator. You're the God of creation. You're the God of the new creation. You're the God of our salvation, the God of our redemption the God who loves us more than we can even fully comprehend. Your love is immeasurable, indescribable, amazing love that rescued us and saved us and called us and chose us and anointed us and healed us and prospered us and filled us. God, you are good and you are great and your mercy endures forever. Today, oh God, as we approach you, we come with worship, we come with thanksgiving, we come with praise, but we also come with hunger. God, we're hungry for you. We're thirsty for you. We need you. We need your refreshing. We need your power. We need your word to work mightily in us. And so, God, the Holy Spirit, come and teach us, bring revelation, illumination, understanding that your word would shape and form and conform us to the image of Jesus. Here we are, God, presenting our lives to you. Come fill us, change us, heal us, and empower us, I pray, in Jesus' name. And the saints of God said, Amen. Amen. I love <laughs> Ezekiel 37, what you prayed. And, you know, the prophet, when you're in the Spirit, you see things that other people don't see. When you're in the Spirit, you hear what others don't hear. Everyone in Israel was going on with business as usual, but he saw Israel as a defeated army. 
He saw by the Spirit. They were marrying, they were eating, they were going to the temple, they were doing business. But Ezekiel saw them as a valley of dry bones, having been not only destroyed by the enemy, devoured by the, by the, 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 the beasts and by the fowl of the air, scattered dry bones. What a horrific image that he saw. But God doesn't just show us stuff to shock us. God showed the prophet this nation as a defeated army, but then he gave him vision, hope, purpose, and a word. And when the prophet spoke the word, the spirit moved. And your pastor shared that so eloquently this morning. This morning as the word comes to you, I'm believing for the spirit to move. And for your lives to be resurrected, raised. Revival means again to live. Revive us, O God, that we may live. Not just live average, mediocre, good, moral, Christian lives. But God, resurrect us in power. To be carriers of your glory to this generation and to this nation that desperately needs God. Your pastor said, the the nation doesn't need revival. The church needs revival. The nation needs evangelism. (laughs) You know, everyone's looking to the White House to bring change. And and of course, policies uh, affect the well-being of the nation. But the White House can't heal America. God's house is the carrier of His healing power and healing word to this nation. If we want the White House to get into order, then the the house of God better get into order first. And I think many Christians are living lukewarm, average, mediocre, weak-kneed, gutless, namby-pamby consumers instead of being carriers of God's glory to this nation. They go through the mere ritual and routine of Christian living, but they're not carrying the Word of God, the power of God, the vision of God in their hearts. They are a defeated army, ripped apart, bones, and uh, and scattered by the beasts. But we weren't raised by the blood of Jesus. Listen, uh, as we were worshiping, I was looking at that cross back there. That cross is not just a symbol of God's death. Uh, As Jesus took our place, hanging poised between hell and heaven on earth as the Lamb of God that was slain for our salvation, that cross not only secures for us an everlasting approach without guilt, without shame, without embarrassment, without nakedness, but that cross is a reminder that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. We were not saved to be an apathetic, lukewarm people. We were saved to be powerful carriers of God's glory. Jesus said, the works that I do, you shall do also. We weren't saved to just go through mere rituals. We were saved to be carriers of God's glory to our families, to our city, and to our nation. Hallelujah. How many of you feel like God's got a plan for your life? He does, to the least of you. Some of you think so low of yourselves that you just live this life of, well, what's in this for me? God's got more than just forgiveness of sins and healing for your body and deliverance from uh, uh, attacks of the devil. God's got glory to fill your life, power to fill your life. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the Spirit of God living in you. The Spirit of Pentecost that filled the upper room is the same Spirit that fills your life today. You're not getting some old, weakened, retired Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit of Pentecost is the Holy Spirit of the church today. Are our hearts open for Him to move? Back to Matthew chapter 4. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, follow me, and I will make you 
fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. He called them, he called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Wow. I, I like to use my imagination when I read scriptures. I don't want to just look at the words on the page. I want to actually climb into the event and stand and gaze at this unfolding scene. When I read this, I don't just, you know, read these words on the page. I actually climb into the Bible, and I go and stand there, and I watch this event unfolding. Can you imagine? There you are doing what you do every single day, and Jesus, who was not a stranger to them, and I'll I'll come to this later, you'll understand that they'd already been to visit Jesus. Jesus had been in the area for some time now. Uh, In fact, some of these fishermen were followers or disciples of John, the Baptist. And when John said, behold the Lamb of God, it takes away the sin of the world. You understand, when, when he saw Jesus in the Spirit, John saw Jesus in the Spirit. He mentioned this to his disciples. These disciples started to follow Jesus to see what's this man that John is pointing to. And in fact, Jesus had spent some time with some of these fishermen, a whole day and into the night. So when he walked past them and said, follow me, they were not strangers to him, and and he was not a stranger to them. He had had time with them, quality time, enough that when he said, follow me, they relinquished everything, dropped what they were doing, and (laughs) Matthew and Mark are, are very clear in their writing, and they use the word immediately. They immediately, there was no hesitation. When the call of God came to their life, they immediately responded, sacrificially, forsaking everything that is legitimate, They were not forsaking sin and illegal things. These were their rights, their inheritance, their family, everything that we hold precious. They were willing to step away from, to step into the call of God. In Luke's gospel, chapter 5, in verses 1 to 11, and again, we'll look at these scriptures every single day for the next few days for their... By Thursday morning, you should have memorized these. (laughs) So it was, as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God. Can you see the crowd around him? Use your imagination. See him standing out, proclaiming the word of God, people all around him. That he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two boats standing by the lake But the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitude from the boat. I like to call that the old-fashioned sound system, the amplification system. (laughs) Because, of course, because he was away, he could cast his voice over the water to the crowd that they could hear him. So Peter loaned him his boat, helped him in his mission. Um, And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I'll let down the nets. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their nets were breaking, so they signaled to their partners to, uh, in other boats to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. Can you imagine? <laughs> Can you imagine that scene? The boats filled. The water is like at the boat level. If they just move, the water comes into the boat. Their boats are filled with this catch. You can't outgive God. <laughs> when, 
Peter loaned the boat. <laughs> God paid him back. <laughs> when you give for the carpeting, for the linoleum, for the renovation of the building, for the expansion of God's kingdom, for world missions, you are not going to lose. Your boat's going to be filled. Hallelujah. All you've got to do is do what God told you to do it, even if it doesn't make sense. Because Peter was an experienced fisherman. He knew the right time to fish, and obviously they had fished. It was not the right time. But nevertheless, at his word, when the word of God comes to you, instantly obey it. Don't hesitate, even if it doesn't make sense, because you're about to get your harvest, your breakthrough. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's not part of the message. It's just something that is very powerful. Then Peter fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will catch men. So when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. Wow, they forsook all and followed him. There are two things I want to briefly address today. The first is God's call to salvation and God's call to service. God's call to salvation and God's call to service. Um, I think the modern day church could be guilty. We don't preach the message of redemption enough. We typically preach messages that are not wrong, but they're absent of the power of the blood of Jesus. They're absent of the cross. We teach more about men than about God's provision to men. And what that has done is it created an environment that people take their salvation for granted. They are not really aware because we don't like using words like sin anymore. We talk more about grace than we do about sin. And I believe in grace. I believe in the righteousness of faith. But we don't address sin. And so when people come to Jesus, many of them think they're doing God a favor. Like, wow, God, you're getting all this potential. (laughs) They don't realize their state without the blood of Jesus shouting louder than our guilt, shame. We are guilty, doomed, and hell bound. It's the love of God that sent Jesus to the cross because he found such worth and how he did that, I have no idea, in man. Because God created man to walk with man, to talk with man, to fellowship with man. We were not created for sin. We were created for righteous communion with God. But when Adam and Eve, our great forefathers yielded to the temptation and partook of the tree. They not only suffered the consequences themselves, but the human race, the entire human race has suffered the consequence of their treason. We were born in sin. Everyone has sinned and come short of the glory of God. But the fact that you come out of your mother's womb, you are ready by the natural birth in sin because of Adam. There are two Adams. There is the first Adam, sinful man, and there is the last Adam, not a second Adam, the last Adam. There's only two men in the face of the earth, Adam and the last Adam. In the first Adam, we are guilty, doomed. In the last Adam, we are redeemed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because he went to the cross and did for us what we could not do for ourselves. He took our place in nakedness, shame, pain, suffering, settling the claims of justice, that His blood would be sufficient to cleanse all men everywhere of every nation, tribe, people, and tongue of our sins and the consequence of Adam's failure. And as a result, His blood speaks louder than our guilt. The devil points a finger at us and says, you're a sinner, and he's correct. You are doomed, and he's correct. 
There's nothing good in you, and he's correct. But the blood of Jesus, the advocate before the Father, says they are not only forgiven, listen to this, they are innocent. The blood doesn't just rescue us and forgives us. The blood declares us to have an equal approach to the Father that Jesus himself has. <laughs> that you can approach God with boldness, with confidence. You can draw near without a sense of guilt, shame, nakedness. But you can stand before God in equality the way Jesus himself approached the Father. Wow. Wow. That's why it's called amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Because Jesus went to the cross. God calls us into salvation. There are many Christians that have lost the joy of their salvation. There are many Christians that don't really appreciate the power of the blood. In the old days, we used to sing songs like, Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Today, they don't speak about the blood. It's become distasteful. Even modern transliterations remove the blood, the verbiage of redemption from the Bible. If it wasn't for the blood, without the shedding of blood, without the shedding of the blood, that's why the song of the Lamb for all eternity will be, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain for our salvation. We don't say worthy are the missionaries, worthy are the evangelists, worthy are the children's teachers. It's worthy is the lamb. Now they did their part, but unless the lamb did for us what we could not do for ourselves, our works are insufficient to gain us an access to the throne of God. Our, you could give every dime you have. You could pray 24-7. You could fast every day until you just are a bag of bones. Your fasting can't save you. Your works can't save you. Your giving can't save you. Your morality can't save you. You can pray. You can go through your rosary beads until there's nothing left on that string. They worn down. Those beads cannot save you. Your confessions can't save you. There's only one thing that can save you. That's the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Many Christians have forgotten that Having been forgiven much, we love much. And so unless you see the sorry state of your life, you will never truly love him much. That's why Paul says to the people, I was the chiefest among all sinners, a blasphemer and a murderer. He knew where he, would co- where he had come from. Even though he was a, a Jew of all Jews, a Pharisee of Pharisees, he was doomed Religion can't save you. Effort can't save you. Only the blood of Jesus. And I pray today that we'll be restored in the joy of our salvation. Because that is the basis of your service. You are, you're not called into service. You are firstly called into salvation. Because without salvation, our efforts, our works, our discipline are fruitless. People say, Leon, you're the hardest working person I've ever met. And I am. I'm a, I labor passionately. I'm consumed in what I'm doing. I travel over 40 weeks, sometimes 45 weeks I'm away from my family a year. You understand the sacrifice. My works would be a waste of time. Circumventing the earth, flying days, weeks of a year would be a waste of time. They cannot save me. Your hard work, your studies can't save you. Only the blood of Jesus. And like Paul, I say I was the chiefest among all sinners. The reason Paul could say I was the chiefest among all sinners because I wasn't born when he said that. (laughs) It's true, it's in the Bible. At that time, he was. But at the time when I was born again, I was. I know where I've come from. I know what he's done for me. And like that woman, I fall at his feet and I bathe him with my tears and appreciation because I've been forgiven much, I love much. And it's that joy of my salvation that keeps me grounded in the purpose of God. 
I'm not working for God. I'm not engaged in the ministry to, uh, because it's going to rescue me, save me. It's the blood of Hallelujah. Jesus and the blood alone that has Thank rescued me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. In Acts chapter 17 and verse 30, he writes, Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. God's calling all men to repentance. Every nation, every people, every tribe, every tongue. Your mother, your father, your uncle, your aunt, your grandparents, your sons, your daughters. Every single person on the face of earth has been provided to by the, by the cross. For God so loved the world. If you took that word world all out and just put your name and every name that you know. For God so loved you your sons, your daughters, your grandkids, every single human being on the face of the earth is in that word world. Hallelujah. Yes. The Bible says it's not God's will that any should perish, but that all should have everlasting life. Hallelujah. I also realize this, that no man comes to the Father unless they're drawn by the Spirit. <laughs> um, in... My own life, I was um, about to go into combat for the first time, pre-dawn strike, and I've been trained, getting ready to go into my first mission, and I suddenly realized, hey, these bullets are real. These aren't the blanks. This is not training. This is the real deal. And I thought, if I get killed today, I'm not ready to meet my maker I wasn't sure who he was, even though I grew up in a godly home with godly parents. I'd go to church and i think, is this the God of the Bible? He seems so diluted. Is this the real deal? Yeah. Anyway, I lay in my foxhole getting ready to storm into combat, and I thought, I better get right with God. So I prayed. I said, Lord, please, I'm not ready to meet you. I need to know who you are. I know I need to get my heart right with you. And I got zilch. I never heard the voice of God. I never heard the sound of angels. There was nothing. I didn't have any peace in my heart. And now we were getting, the clock was counting down. I, thought, I said, God, I, I, I know I'm not right with you, but please, if you keep me alive, I will serve you. I will find out who you are. I will serve you. I didn't believe in the Big Bang. I didn't believe in the evolution theories. I, I looked at creation. I said, this is not an accident. There is a designer behind all this. It's too detailed. The little insects, the bigger creatures that eat the little insects, and I saw this whole circle of life. There has to be someone behind it all. Who are you? So I came out of the military a few years later, pretty messed up, but I kept my vows. I said, God, I'm going to find you, and I went from church to church cult to cult, religion to religion, and I'd go in, i think, this isn't it, this isn't it, this isn't it. And I thought I was looking for God, but the truth is, God had already been drawing me by His Spirit. Not one of us is saved because we sought God. I want you to know, God sought you out before you sought Him. Hallelujah. Before the foundation of the earth, you were already in the heart of God. Before you were in your mother's womb, you were already in the heart of God. Hallelujah. Today, you are not only here as the product of the, the grace of God, the blood of Jesus, but the call of God is upon your life. Hallelujah. In World War II, uh, it went something like this. When you were called into the military, you received a telegram. How many of you remember the days of telegrams? <laughs> the kids wouldn't know what a telegram is. It's like an old-fashioned email. Yeah. It's an old-fashioned text <laughs> message that would come delivered to your door, and you'd have to sign for it as evidence. <laughs> Congratulations, you have been selected to serve your nation. <laughs> Let me say this to you all. Congratulations, you have been selected to serve God. You are not just selected to avoid hell and make heaven. You have been handpicked by God, blood washed by the grace of God to serve God. Hallelujah. Not just to know Him, 
but to serve Him. Hallelujah. Now, you're not saved by your service. You're saved by the blood. But you have been called. You have been handpicked by God. In Acts chapter 9, Saul was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. He went to the high priest, got the letters, went to the synagogue to Damascus to take them and imprison them. And then along the way, it says, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, who you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Jesus and the Holy Spirit had already been calling Saul. <laughs> it says you've been kicking against the goads. Um, he had been resisting. The, another translation will say you've been resisting the pricks. Because what would they would do is have a sharp stick and they would prick the, the ox to turn. And he had been resisting the pricking. And I think eventually the Holy Spirit was jabbing him a little harder and a little harder. And he'd still insist on doing his own thing, born out of his religiosity and culture, resisting God. Because I believe Stephen, when he said, forgive them, don't lay this charge to them, there was a prayer prayed for Saul at that point. And the church was praying, God, our persecutors are coming. Please save this man, Saul, who's so vehement against this that we are uh, enjoying. And then, not only that, but the Bible says, before you were in your mother's womb, Saul, in Galatians, I separated you. God had a plan for Saul from the foundations of the earth, prepared good works for him that he may walk in it. It's called, and I don't want to get into too much doctrine here, but it's called election in the foreknowledge of God. Now, in election, it's number one, election is not automatic. It's grace. Number two, you're not a puppet on a string and you just do what God wants you to do. Your will is very much engaged and you have to believe in your heart that God has raised him from the yeah. dead and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Yeah. And then you have to repent and turn around. It's not an automatic salvation because you are selected, elected, called, chosen. You have to go the way of every single person that comes to salvation by faith, through grace. You call on the name of the Lord. It's not your works. It's His work that saves you. Hallelujah. But everyone that is saved is called by God. Everyone that is saved is handpicked by God. No different to Jeremiah before he was in his mother, mother's womb. No different to Moses who was protected supernaturally by God. No different to any man, woman of God throughout church history. You have been handpicked by God for a time such as this. Esther was handpicked by God for her generation. David, Moses, Caleb, every one of them by design. You are, have been saved and chosen by God in design. Hallelujah. Whether you'll step into it or not is your decision. You are not a puppet on a string. You can resist God or you can embrace Him. There are many people that are resistant of God and they stay in that place of bitterness and suffering and sin and guilt and shame way longer than what they should have. The sooner you yield and surrender, because God called you, doesn't mean you have to be indifferent and you're just like this automatic uh, energizer bunny bean that just goes around doing what he wants you to do. Your will is engaged. Even Jesus, not my will, but your will be done. I've come to do thy will, O God. My meat is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. It's not automatic. You have to be engaged. You have to be locked in. And many Christians uh, have been called by God. Many are called, but few are chosen. The difference is what you do with the call of God that comes on your life. You're not just called from sin to avoid hell and make heaven. You're called by God to live as a light shining in the earth today. Thank you, Jesus. 
you've been chosen by God. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4, he says, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. That's not working out you, in your own energy. That holiness is the, the positional truth that you have through the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. And then, and without blame, is what you do with that positional truth. So you are free from guilt and shame, but then you have to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, making sure that you stay locked in to the things of God. It also says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, Ephesians 2, and not of your works or not of yourself. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any should boast. For we are his workmanship. <laughs> the word workmanship means artistic masterpiece. You are God's artistic masterpiece. Hallelujah. 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 <laughs> created. You are God's artistic masterpiece. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. Not saved to work, but saved by grace yes. to do the work of God. So everyone saved is called to the good work of salvation. Hallelujah. I've got to bring this in. And I, there's a, how many of you know this phrase, what's in it for me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, you've got LOL and uh, what are some of the other acronyms that they use? Uh, OMG, LOL, here's one for you, W-I-I-F-M, <laughs> what's in it for me? <laughs> How many remember uh, President JFK making the statement, uh, ask not what your country yeah. can do for you, but what can you do for your country? It's called your inalienable right. It's a pursuit of happiness and peace, isn't it? That's the very nature of our constitution. There is a constitution of heaven. And even though you have rights, you understand, everyone has rights as an American. In the kingdom, we have rights. But many people want the country to do for them yes. what they ought to do for the country. Yeah. It's the what's in it for me mentality. What can America yeah. do for me? Not what, God, what can I do to enhance this nation? What can I do to build this nation? What can they do for me? We've raised up a generation of takers, of consumers, yeah. not who want to invest their life into something else. Nowadays, uh, in World War II, 18-year-olds were storming the beaches. Now 18-year-olds have to be sitting comforted in little huddle groups because their selection of president didn't come through. They're so weak, so weak because we've raised up this generation that doesn't want to pay a price, doesn't want to take it by force, don't want to be engaged. We want someone else to suffer for us. And if they suffer us, we're the recipients of their suffering, their fighting, their giving, their praying, their working. We don't want to join the work. Yeah. Right. That's, good. That's why I love what Apostle Paul said. His first words out of his mouth, Lord, what do you want me to do? Today, our modern theology is, Lord, what can you do for me? We have created the spiritual Santa Claus. That's it. That's it. And he is the giver of every good and perfect gift. And he is super generous. And he is kind. And he is merciful. But we've not raised up a people to say, what can I do for the kingdom? What can I do for the church? We've raised up a people. What can the church do for me? And the moment the church doesn't do for them what they think it should do, there's another hundred down the road that they will go to and try find that perfect place, but it's not perfect because you're in it, honey. We have to have a shift in our culture from this Western worldview to the biblical kingdom worldview. The biblical kingdom worldview of the church is not what can the church do for me, but what can I do for it? Because men have laid down their lives for it. People have given. When they could have gone on vacations, they were sowing their homes, their finance, their retirements. That we have benches to sitting and lights that go on and sound systems 
people have given for us, what will we do for the future generations? And that's why I like this theme, follow him, because he says, follow me and I will make you. God wants to make us something, carriers of his glory. Amen. We're not just called into salvation, we're called into service. How many of you remember the story of the pearl of great price? When he discovered the pearl of great price, he went and got rid of everything to get this pearl. That's what they did when they forsook their family, their business, their boats, their nets. They discovered that in Jesus, he had everything they desired and wanted. And so it was rather a shift in priority. What people do today is they want forgiveness of sins. They want their name in the Lamb's book of life, but they don't want to forsake all. They want to keep all and have the pearl of great price. And they think, well, I'll forsake my sin. I'll forsake the bad things, but they don't want to embrace the full measure of God's redemption. They just want forgiveness. They just want their name in the Lamb's book of life to avoid eternal punishment. You have to forsake all. This isn't some little thing that if you're called to be a missionary, if you're called to be an evangelist, this is when you receive Jesus, every other God must come off from its place of rule in your life. There is only one true and living God. You can't have idols. You can't have things in your life that dominate, control, and lure you away. You have to push, press into what God's got for your life. So our people will go to church week in, week out, very loyal, very faithful, but they disengage. They're not locked in. They're not seeking God. They're living on one meal a week. Their spirit's suffering. They're not in the glory of God. They're not pressing in. So when you have special meetings, they roll their eyes thinking, wow, four nights of meetings. Because there's no spiritual appetite. Because what's in it for me? I can just do my little token Christian thing on a Sunday morning. Traditional Christianity has robbed people of the power of God. Yes, it has. Yes, that's very good. The call of God should be received as a pearl of great price, even though it's the free gift. But everything that dominates, controls, has to be relinquished. I'm going to close with this. The gospel of Jesus expels. What does it expels? It expels all lesser treasures so that you possess the great treasure. And when the gospel comes, it expels all the old appetites, the old desires. That's what Paul writes, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation, the old has passed away, behold, all things are new. In other words, what is the priority of heaven becomes your priority. What is important to God becomes important to you. The things that you thought you would never do, now you want to do it because you're a new creation. You're not just forgiven, you're a new creation. There's a difference between forgiveness and a new creation. We are not just the recipients of forgiveness. We are the recipients of a new creation miracle. Hallelujah. The greatest of all miracles. When you are born again and the gospel penetrates your life, the longings that you had, the delights that you had, become unimportant. Suddenly, these things that you thought would never be important in your life become your priority, your urgency, your highest responsibility. Hallelujah. You can't have both the old and the new. You embrace the new. You can't accommodate the old. <laughs> you have to relinquish the old in exchange for the new. You can't keep both worlds. So when the call of Jesus came to them, they forsook their nets. Now remember, Jesus had forsaken the carpenter shop to obey God. Elisha forsook his plow, his field, his mother and father to pursue the call of God. Everyone is called by God, but what they want to do is accommodate it in the leftovers of their time and energy. You can't accommodate the call of God. Yes. 
it possesses you. Yeah. <laughs> it possesses you. It's a 24-7 thing. Now, you can be in business, but the call of God possesses you. The love of God possesses yeah. you. You can be, uh, 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 um, you know, loyal and hardworking in the business world, but you still have the highest priority, the will of God. Yeah. You're seeking Him. You're not just accommodating it in the leftovers of your life. We need a switch of priority in the modern day yeah. church to make His business our business, His priorities our priority. Close with this. Let's stand and let's pray. Elisha left his plow. The fishermen left their nets. Matthew left his tax collecting table. Jesus left his carpenter shop. Saul left his mission to destroy the church. That wasn't just because they are Bible characters. You are the continuum of the Bible. The continuum writings of what God's doing as men and women filled with the Holy Spirit. Someone asked me, should I give up my business because the call of God, the call of salvation is upon my life? If he requires that, yes. Remember when the rich young ruler came to him and said, he said, okay, go give all that you have and follow me. He didn't give that to everyone that came to him. He gave it to the rich young ruler. But he did say to everyone, if anyone wants to come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. Everyone has to live in a place of denying the rights and the responsibilities of the world, of what everyday normal living looks like to embrace the kingdom of God. You say, Leon, that's so radical. That's what we need. Because what we're doing is not working. We may be skilled fishermen, but our boats are not filled. We've got to do the Word of God. If we want our boats to be filled, we've got to do what God's Word says. We need a shift. We need a shift from being Americans to kingdom citizens. We need a shift from being consumers to givers. We need a shift from what's in it for me, like what can I do for it? We need the shift to take place. And they followed him. He led the way, the way of the cross, the way of glory, the way of power. We want to be followers of him.